Uh, hi guys, welcome to Football with Brownie. Hope you're well, keeping safe, keeping each other safe and spreading a love in this big bad world of ours. Before we go any further, check that ticker bar below. Please like, share, most importantly, subscribe to Football with Brownie. Remember, subscription is free. If you haven't done it yet, hit that subscriber button right now. And don't forget the notification bell. Okay, this week's interview, I'm very, very pleased. And uh, I've been wanting to do it for quite a while now, Warren. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's um, former Newcastle, Wimbledon. Let me give us right now: Maidstone, QPR, Dagenham and Redbridge, and uh, obviously England international Warren Barton. Warren, many many thanks for joining. Absolute pleasure, my friend. No problem. You done well to remember the clubs, so you done. Well I know. You know. You, you know what? I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Is because it's. Well, it's one of the few players, Warren, well, I'll be honest with you, basically done a, com a complete circle, you know, going back to, to where you well, started. Yeah, yeah, I went and, back home. Yeah, yeah. And, right, you have to you have to fill me in on the gap at the moment, right? <laughs> um, now, some people's, some uh, information I'm getting is saying you started at Maidstone, but others are saying you started at Dagenham. Um, so what what was because I'm also told you you went from Dagenham as a youngster uh, to Maidstone uh, together with John Still and other players. Is that right? Yeah, what it was I was at, uh, as a young boy I got told twice too small. So I was at Leighton Orient with Frank Clark, uh, the Newcastle legend. He was a manager there in the football league. Uh, they let me go when I was too small. So I went to my local non-league team, which was called Leighton Stone Ilford, but later was Dagenham and Redbridge. Right. So I was playing for Dagenham and Redbridge, um, had uh, about 18 months there, uh, did well. John Steele was at Maidstone. They got promotion right. to the Football League. So me and John and three players swapped over. So I left Dagenham and Redbridge. I could have stayed non-league, but I had a chance to be... Uh, a professional uh, football player at Maidstone when they got promoted with Keith Peacock and Tommy Taylor, the old West Ham uh, player, uh, at, at Maidstone. And so I swapped over. They stayed non-league. I went football league. And then 10 months later, I was playing in the, the old first division, which is the Premier League now with Wimbledon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It worked out quite well. So me and I me know. And swapped over. Um, Still, he was great, you know, a, a very, very good non-league manager, managing the Football yeah. League as well. So, uh, become a good friend of mine for her, my career um, and gave me the opportunity to go to Maystone. Um, he liked me there, but he was never going to uh, go full time. So, I went, I went in one direction, he went in the other with three other players uh, and the rest is history, as they say. Yeah, no, I'm, because I'm trying to figure out, um, I'm, a, I'm a Cardiff fan uh, and my... Um, my local team, uh, Murphy Tidville, and I'm trying to figure out whether I would have watched you play uh, in the conference against Murphy for Dagenham and Redbridge, or was it just maybe a, a season before? I was trying to figure out. I think it might have been a season before because we I got you. promoted into, into the, the conference then, the Southern Conference, and then... Uh, then it was a national conference, and then it's changed its name about eight times. So, yeah. uh, I think I went to Cardiff on tour, uh, but I never went and, and played against them. No, so a lot of our ones was more in the southeast of England uh, that we played the, the non-league games because it was yeah. that second tier. But yeah, yeah. no, I've not, had, I've not had the pleasure of being a beauty. Oh. Here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, um, I think it's because my age. You know, when it, when you go over ninety one, ninety two, or ninety, you know, and yeah, yeah. it's uh, yeah, it's my age. So uh, going on, uh, I would I made some. Mate, it's a cracking uh, uh, season, uh, and you ended up in the, the playoffs. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, it, it, uh, lost to Cambridge in semi finals. Yeah, no, it was a you know really exciting season. Obviously, first time it was for a non-league team. It was it was big. It's a big club. It was well supported. The finances were good. We even had the blazers and the flannel trousers and the ties to to travel to games in. We was looked after on the on the trains when we went to games. Um, and so it was really exciting. You know, as I said, people like Tommy Taylor, who was who was an yeah. ex West Ham player, was one of the assistant coaches, and Keith Peacock, who worked under. Alan Kerbersley for Charlton for many, many years was my manager. So I had two good people, uh, good non-league players that had stayed at the club and obviously players that we brought in as well. Uh, yeah, and we actually, me and Dion Dublin, uh, he was at Cambridge yeah. at the time with John Beck. And uh, we got to the final and they managed to beat us over two legs. But 
in that run uh, for the season and being where it was just outside the M25 in London, uh, there was a lot of scouts that was coming down. Tottenham was one. Even I heard now that Newcastle had shown a bit of interest as well, um, oh, playing yes. non-league uh, and lower league. Um, but Wimbledon made the jump and for them to pay, spend 300000 at that time, was yeah. a record for them, you know, for that to, to go and do that. And they'd gone that with lower league players like John Scouts, uh, Keith Curl, they'd gone, Terry Phelan, yeah. they bought lower league. Uh, and I was just another one of them conveyor belt players that they was picking up. Um, and obviously had the opportunity to go and play for the, the crazy gang, which was, uh, right. which, 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 you know which what? was great. I tell you what, uh, Warren. Have you got a camera in this uh, in this room of mine? Because you you actually read in my notes as we speak. You are <laughs> you are right. Uh, you know, it were the three hundred thousand pound was a was a record for uh, a player uh, in the uh, well from the fourth tier at the time. And um, just unfortunately, though, a couple of years later, after after you left me, made so unfortunately, uh, you. You know that money didn't just papered over cracks, really, and um, I, I, I don't know. I don't. What is it with Kent? Kent seems to be a, a massive catchment area, but not really. Uh, you know, a a, a a a big football club. I don't know what it is there in that area. Yeah, I mean, you look at you know, obviously Gillingham, Maidstone. Yeah. They've come back to their own uh, old stadium now. Uh, I know some of the people that was there. Um, from way back in the non-league days, uh, yeah, I mean it's a it's a big catchment area. It's a big area. Um, you, you're right though. I don't think it's predominantly a real football region. You know, not like Essex yeah. or you go into Manchester or you go into Cardiff or you you know certain Liverpool. Certain areas are real hotbed of, of, of football. But Kent was more maybe a, a, an older affluent area. Uh, maybe yeah. not really got the the kids but there is there's obviously been players that have come through that but i understand what you're saying you know when i, I yeah. looked at certain areas of the country you know you, there was a conveyor belt particularly in the essex area of like merson and tony adams myself ray parlor rob lee frank lampard there's so many people that have come from that area um you know playing in that area because it was a real hotbed for young kids playing football yeah you know but kent seems to be maybe as i said a bit more of a an older uh, affluent retirement area um, and maybe not into it but you know as I said Gillingham and, and Maidstone they yeah. still get the crowds they still love their team and, and support them but at the time when I was at Maidstone we played at, Dart at Dartford which is just okay. off the M25 so we yeah. were actually renting a stadium because we didn't have one at the time and, and you rightly said a couple of years later the, the club had financial problems and, and drifted out and, and down the football league, which was obviously yeah, a, big it's, it's a shame. But uh, good luck to them. I, I know a, a Phoenix club has, has, has since started, and uh, good luck to them in the future. Um, with regarding uh, Wimbledon, uh, one I know that uh, uh, you joined them uh, slightly, uh, slightly late on into a top tier uh, promotion. Um, do you, do you think that uh, the media, the crazy gang you've already mentioned, uh, is it? Is it a warranted kind of nickname, or is it just a press? Uh, no, no, no. No, no, we we warranted it. Don't worry. About <laughs> it. We we, uh, we you know the players beforehand, Wally Downs, you know Vinnie Jones, obviously have been there, Glenn Hodges, you know, and then uh, Big John Fashionew. So there were some real leaders and characters there, and, and obviously going to a cup final against the mighty Liverpool and. Dennis Wise and Laurie Sanchez um, getting the header to beat. It's probably the biggest shock in domestic uh, cup football ever. You know, when you think of what Wimbledon had come through, the statue of Liverpool winning numerous European Cups, yeah. numerous titles, for Wimbledon to go in there and to beat them. And they thrived on that atmosphere and that chip on your shoulder. No one likes us and we don't really care, to be honest yeah. with you. But we had some good players. As I said, we could play. Uh, but we knew our strengths. Um, but yeah, the crazy gang, you know, people setting you know, people's clothes on fire when they turn up to the team, you know, going. I remember when I first got selected for England and, you know, training, Joe Kinnear had said, you know, great congratulations to Warren. Train, come to my car in the car park. My pride and joy at the time was a, a secondhand Saab, which was my my first status of being a Premier League player. <laughs> All the tyres have been slashed. So I've gone to Vinny and, 
John Fashion, I said, look, you're out of order. You know, like, there's money I can't afford. You're slashing my... T-. They went, we never did it. I swear, like, it wasn't us. <laughs> it, was, it was the owner of Wimbledon. It was the owner, Sam Amman. Sam Amman. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you know of him at, at, at Cardiff, obviously. And he, he was the one that did it to bring my... You know, keep your feet on the ground. And, you know, we'd have our music playing in the, in the changing room. And a lot of games we would win in the tunnel. You know, at the time, Sky weren't coming down the tunnels and, and looking. So a lot of things would happen down there. Um, <laughs> And we did what we needed to do, you know. Yeah. Is it the Pep Guardiola way? Is it the art of football as we know it? But we did what we needed to do. And the well, times exactly. in the Premier League, we we didn't finish below ninth. Uh, and when you think of the resources that we had, and I think the biggest compliment we got was Sir Alex Ferguson when we played against Manchester United at Selhurst Park. And we tried every trick in the book to try and win the game, you know, whatever. There's a famous tackle of Vinny. Well, it wasn't yeah. even a tackle. It's probably GBH on, on <laughs> Eric, Eric Cantona's waist. And uh, Sir Alex put in his book later, he said he knew we'd win the title, not maybe beating Arsenal or beating Chelsea or beating Man City. It was the fact that they wasn't intimidated by, by Wimbledon. And um, so that's a big credit because they had, you know, Steve Bruce, Michael, Paul Ince, Mark Hughes, Dennis Irwin, Giggs was breaking through, Lee Sharp was there. They had some outstanding players. And for Sir Alex to say that about us, a bunch of crazy gang, lower league players, um, was a big, big compliment. And um, uh, it, it was fun time, you know, as, as I said, you know, playing non-league and then mm-hmm. playing for Maidstone in the Football League and then going to Wimbledon was probably the ideal club because of the culture and the mentality it was about sticking together, working hard. There was no egos. There was no... All right, you had Vinny and Fash, which was the big names, but we all worked together and we all, we all looked after each other on and off the field. And we still now, with 18, 20 of us, communicate on WhatsApp, you know. We're, oh, we're, we're done, yeah. talking then. So, you know, we, we have a good rapport with each other. We knew what we was. We had some good players, as I said, some, some players that could play and played at a high level, international level, but we knew what our strengths was and that was making it uncomfortable for other teams. What do you think as well, Warren? Um, because at at, at George times when we were we playing at Selhurst Park, uh, you know the, the crowds weren't the best uh, uh, for a v- variety of reasons, really. But do you think that that kind of very much I suppose like Luton and QPR, you know, even going further back with their plastic pitches? Do you think the, the lower crowd, the low crowds in Selhurst Park, in them actually benefited? Uh, uh, Wimbledon, rather than you know uh, the bigger clubs playing in front of thousands and thousands. Do you think that that could have? Uh... Um, I know what I'd rather play in front of, but yeah, I, I, when we were at Plough Lane, obviously there the it was a smaller stadium. The training ground, the training room was was tiny. It was concrete floor. It, you know, it was cold. It was damp. It wasn't like going to Old Trafford or Highbury or Anfield. You know, it was totally different. It was lower league. When we went to Sellers Park, obviously we we couldn't get the attendance that we wanted. A lot of fans wasn't happy that we moved across, um, so that they had that problem there. But because of the Premier League and how it started evolving, and the expectation and the excitement of the fans, we'd get a lot of you know fans, just casual fans watching wanting to yeah. watch a Premier League game. And obviously when we played Man United, it was more like a home game or Arsenal. There was a lot of Arsenal fans there, Tottenham. Um, but you're right, it wasn't always full up. You know, we played Bolton on a night game. And me and Terry Gibson, the old Manchester United and uh, and Spurs player, we actually was doing a warm-up and we counted how many people was in the in the stadium <laughs> before we kicked off. And there was about 350 people there. And in the end, <laughs> the lowest attendance of just under 2,000, which was obviously embarrassing, but it is what it is. But it soon oh, changed yeah, really. and, and it went forward. But yeah, you, it, right, it wasn't... And also, if you've ever been to Selhurst Park, it's one of the hardest stadiums to get out of as well with the road. Yeah, get, as a supporter, getting to and from is a nightmare. Yeah, it's not, it's not yeah. the easiest place to get to. But, you know, we, we, we used the attendances went up. We'd get people going to watch the games. And um, again, it was another string to our bow that we'd play, play that to our advantage if we could. Yeah. Um, then because, uh, well, because you played so well at, at Wimbledon and become... Um, become very highly thought of, went to Newcastle for four million, a then, a then British record uh, transfer for a defender, and who joined, even as a neutral, um, a wonderfully gifted and entertaining uh, uh, team uh, under Kevin Keegan. Your first season 
must have been a roller coaster. Uh, <laughs> because you know, we all we all have seen uh, the Kevin Keegan interview at, at the end, but being ten points ahead at one point, uh, and then and then losing losing the lead with such a um, uh, such a vast array of talent in our team. What 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 a first season for you at the two? Yeah, I mean, it was obviously immense pride being a record defender at the time for yeah. for someone that had been told twice you're too small, not going to make it, playing lower league. So I was very proud of that. Uh, what I was delighted two days later, Les Ferdinand come in and he was six million. So he, he broke my record. So that was good. The pressure was off, off a little <laughs> bit. But it was just a wonderful time. You know, you had um, 15,000 fans on the waiting list to be a season ticket holder. You had 10,000 people outside the club shop at midnight waiting for the new shirts to be launched. Um, the city was vibrant. It was exciting. Uh, the style of football that we played was, you know, we got to have the name, the entertainers, uh, was obviously something to be proud of as well. Some of the quality of players that we had, um, but ultimately never day goes past that we don't all think about that. We, we failed, you know, we, we come second twice to Man United and they just had the know-how of winning the league. You know, we, we was yes. playing on emotion. We was playing on football. We was, as I said, you, it was a roller coaster. You know, Kevin yeah. is that type of guy. He's one minute he's up, next he's down, and we we couldn't stop it. The, the harder we tried, it was like the sand slipping through your fingers. The the harder we tried, the worse it got. And unfortunately, in the end, you know, we we, we come short, but we give it everything we had. Um, as I said, the the style of football was sensational. Some of the players that we play with, the likes of Ginola Aspria. Uh, yeah. Obviously, Alan Shearer coming for a world record, and Les was there. Shaka Hislop, you know Rob Lee. You know it, it was just wonderful, wonderful times, and, and all good people. Peter Beardsley was, was was great, and you know maybe that lack of experience of winning a title. Uh, Peter had only been the one to win it. Kevin had won it obviously as a player, but not as a coach, yeah. and he was going to win it his way. He wasn't ever going to deviate and and change our our way of thinking. You know, if you get two, we get three. You get three, we get four. Um, and you can't always do that as the game's evolved. We can't do it, but it was it was such an exciting time to be involved um, and to be part of that it was wonderful, but also heartbreaking at the same time because not yeah. really for, for me or for the players, but just for the club when you see Leicester, Blackburn, uh, as well as the likes of Man United, Arsenal, Chelsea and you know, Man City now being there. We should have had our name there for the, for the people, for the area. But unfortunately, it, it didn't happen. So, um, you know, we're disappointed with that. Do you think, um, you know, I, following the season, I think uh, uh, Kevin Keegan, I think, uh, 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 left the club. Do you think he he ever got over that uh, uh, that ending to the season? Um, both as a, 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 you know, as, as a person, but also as a manager as well. And uh... Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the way we try to get over it, we've all... Alan Shearer for 15 million. Um, yeah. And all I can speak about as players is normally you used to get like three or four weeks off. Uh, we had about a week off and myself, Les, uh, Lee Clark, um, Steve Howie, Steve Watson. There was about eight or nine of us, Robbie Elliott. We'd come back early and we was working out in the gym uh, after 10 days of losing it, um, yeah. going back early to get ready. I think what took Kevin by surprise is that obviously the, the club would then went on the stock exchange. He got floated. It, you know, it went from being Sir John and Freddie Shepherd and Douglas Hall to then being answer to a board members. And Kevin found that very difficult to understand um, the way the game was changing. We see now with, you know, with Manchester United and all the, the problems that they're having, um, you know, he, he, he found it very, very difficult. Um, but it, it did hit him very hard because he, he put so much into that. And we'd all gone there, you know, yes, for Newcastle and, and the club of the fans. But the first input we had was Kevin. You know, he, he met me in a hotel in London and said, come and join a big club. It wasn't taking a tour around the stadium, around the city. It was actually meeting Kevin. And, and it, it was he was the one that, that said, come and join a big club and be part of it. And um, we all did that. So it was a major shock when he left particularly we're just beating Tottenham 7-1 at home. <laughs> yeah. So he yeah. decided to leave, um, you know, and it was obviously hugely disappointing, but the, the club reacted very quickly. We got Kenny Dalgleish, which was a living legend. You know, he'd done great mm -hmm. at Liverpool uh, and obviously at Blackburn. Had a great relationship with Alan, which was important because Alan was yeah. a big part of, of Newcastle. Um, 
and we ended up finished second and got to a cup final. So, you know, as much as it was disappointing and it was heartbreaking that he left and he, he felt that it was the time to go, as players, you're quite resilient. You know, you, you, it says it on the title, you're professional. So you have to get on with it. And um, we did. And we managed, as I said, to get to a cup final, got in the Champions League and finished second again. Um, slightly different to the year before where we was in front um, and the football was a little bit different. Um, but we managed to get, you know, in, into a level where we could compete in the Champions League and uh, and obviously come second to Man United again because they was, they was flying at the time. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, we both go. And the other, uh, you mentioned Ken Douglas, the other two uh, uh, managers you had at Newcastle so was um, uh, Ruth Hollett and uh, the late great Bobby Robson. Can you tell, uh, you know, your, your experience as a player and, uh, and the both of them? Because, um, you know, both massive names in the game. Uh, and, um, and you know, I, I think uh, the, the hierarchy at Newcastle still wanted to maintain that kind of flowing football, but with different... Uh, you know, different uh, managers at the helm. Yeah, I mean, the, the DNA of Newcastle and the problem that other managers have had with, with Mike Ashley and particularly Steve Bruce at the, the end of his reign was the fans want to be entertained. OK, if we lose, they don't like it, but they'd rather lose having a go, not sitting there and defending, defending and trying to get a goal on a set piece or a counter-attack play, you know. So it was important to play the style of football that Kevin had played when he was there with Chrissy Waddle. Terry McDermott, Peter Beersley and John Anderson, them type of players. And then that had gone into translated into this team of the entertainers. So Kenny was slightly different. You know, he made us a bit more defensive minded. And, you know, that helped us get to second spot because we go to Arsenal and win 1-0. We go to stadiums and win 1-0. Um, was it the entertaining way? No, but we was winning and getting success. Uh, Rude had, it, had come in and uh, said we was going to get this sexy football well. It wasn't sexy at all, you know. It was it was alienating, you know, friends of mine, Stuart Pearce, Rob Lee, Nikos Davizas, John Barnes, just pushing them aside and not having him part of the team, trying to get rid of Alan Shearer, which was a big part yeah, of, the, yeah. of the club and the history. His man management skill was poor. His his idea about the game was was obviously great, but his man management skill was was poor. He wasn't really good with people, and so Bobby comes in, you know, within a couple of days transformed the mood of the city you know knew yeah. knew the club knew the people knew the city um he said to alan shearer on the first training session we had why do you keep coming short for the ball and alan being alan said well rude hullet told me to come and keep the ball and bobby said you're the best striker in the league i want you facing the goal we go and play sheffield wednesday two days later on the saturday and we beat them eight nil and alan gets five goals um and yeah you know, that's how yeah. that's how quickly it can change and for me, Bobby was the perfect manager for that club. You know, great with the fans, great with the media. Tactics was good. Knew, very much similar to Sir Alex Ferguson, knew to get rid of players at the right time. You know, yeah. we don't like it, but me and Rob Lee was, we, we felt that we could still play. But so Bobby said, you know, uh, unfortunately, you, we're going to have to ask you to move on. And he bought Jermaine Genius and that, and Hughes and things changed. I was 33, nearly 34. Rob was 36. He felt it was the right time and you know a little while later they're back in the champions league so so bobby was magnificent and under all of them coaches you know i was lucky enough to learn off of people like them terry venables as well with england in euro 96 to learn off of someone like him you know all great football people uh, even in their own ways uh, but for me bobby ticked every box because he was just the epitome of what you should be as a manager um and when you hear pep the way he talks about things and his mannerisms, you can see a little bit of Bobby has rubbed off on him, you know, about the yeah, game, about yeah, the players. Yeah, Barcelona, Barcelona. yeah, exactly. So they would have yeah. come across, and, you know, the, you can tell he, he has an effect on so many people that he's worked with. Um, and I know he's had an effect with me about how you live your life, how you want your things to, to, to go in life. And he, he's a big part of that. And he's sorely missed uh, because yeah. he was a great man. He was a great man. Um. Just touching on the England uh, uh, international uh, scene, uh, Warren, because uh, you had your, your caps while at Newcastle. Oh, what a debut. <laughs> what, a, what a crazy debut. Uh, for people who don't know, um, I, I don't know if you wanted to fill them in. It was, um, it was the, the riot in, uh, in Dublin, wasn't it? Yeah, I got, I got asked a question. Uh, actually, funny enough, yesterday, what's the best moment and the worst moment? So, 
obviously the best moment was being selected for England. I've been in the England setup for about eight or nine months, but uh, this was actually making my debut. We were playing Ireland in Lounsdown Road, and obviously, you know, the mid nineties there was still a bit of politics and history, um, and there was a, an atmosphere in the stadium as well. Uh, going into it and you know we was getting ready for Euro 96 with the, the big tournament coming in in England and looking forward to that and you could just feel it in the air that there was a, a sense of hostility not with the Irish the Irish was fantastic but with the England there wasn't even fans there was hooligans that was going out there to just purely cause trouble so we start the game the booing the hissing goes on Ireland oh Dave Kelly the uh, Newcastle player he puts Ireland ahead uh, and then after 20 odd minutes, 23, 27 minutes later, yeah. all hell breaks loose. The, the fans start rioting in the stadium. They start throwing bits of seats and wood down at the Irish fans. And underneath that is where all the English families are. You know, the, the, yeah. the yeah. people that... I can, I can see the images in, in my mind uh, about it. And, um, yeah, and just... we, you know... As much as you, you try, people like Points was great. Tony Adams with me, you know, put their arms around me and telling me to, you know, it'll be all right to go. And then you walk off the field, the game had been stopped. Big Jack Charlton was great. Terry Feeland, my ex Wimbledon teammate, he was playing for Ireland at the time. He said, Look, it's be all right. We'll look after your family because my mum was there, my dad, my fiance, which is my wife now, she was there. They looked after them. Um, and it was just very surreal. You know, you have the bursting of pride. You're singing the national anthem, you're ready to play for England. I know. You know, obviously you're a Cardiff fan, but for me, it's, <laughs> it's the biggest honour. I, I, listen, yeah. I shared the room, I shared a room with Gary Speed for three years, four years. Oh, ago. that's fair enough. That's fair enough. I, I know how the Welsh are, so I, I know how they are. <laughs> um, you know, it was pride and then it was devastation because it's supposed to be one of the most memorable moments of your life. Any athlete to represent their country at any, any sport, any level is, is the epitome. Uh, but to have it took away by a group of people just purely going out and it caused trouble uh, was disheartening. But, you know, I got a couple of chances again later uh, with Terry, played against Brazil, Sweden um, as well. But, it, 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 you know, your first one, you, you, you never sort of get over. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I've never really gotten over that. And then, unfortunately, you know, I wasn't able to get back in the squad again. Gary Neville was doing well uh, with David Beckham. They had a great relationship and, you know, it was hard for me to break in. Glenn Johnson then come along, Michael Richards. Um, you know, it, it was tough. You know, when I was breaking in, you had people like Paul Ince, uh, sorry, Paul Parker, uh, Rob Jones, uh, Richard Hedgel was breaking in. You know, David Bars at QBR yeah. was doing well. Lee Dixon. You know, you had about five or six players playing in the Premier League that was English. So it, it was tough. Yeah. Uh, and obviously Gary come in and, and the rest is history. But, you know, to say to someone that you played non-league football, you got told twice you was never going to make it, um, to represent your country is the biggest honour. And you know, Oh, I'm absolutely. Proud. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, um, I, I've uh, interviewed a number of footballers now, but um, because, I, um, because I followed Cardiff in the old Division 4, I first uh, followed Cardiff in the old Division 4, you know, I watched Merthyr, in the conference in the old seven league it does it, it does generate a little bit more interest in me uh you know because it uh it uh, sent, gives me memories of, of what football was like at that kind of level back in that day you know and you know i remember watching stan collymore play for uh, uh stafford rangers you know and and it um it, it really does uh it really does uh you know put a smile on my face uh yeah i mean you know you look at when Chrissy Waddle was said played non-league, right uh, yeah. Ian Wright, I played against him when he's at Dulwich, uh, when he was at Dulwich Hamlet, and then you know Vardy, you know great story from him yeah. playing non-league, and it just shows you, you know people do slip through the nest, and you know, not everybody's had the the silver spoon where you've played academy football since you was 11, 12, gone in the reserves, played there, you know, for me playing non-league has probably made me the person I am because I work yeah. hard, I, I give it everything, and I. As I said, people ask me about your time at Newcastle at Wimbledon. I loved every minute of it. I, you know, I, I loved it. It was it was the best feeling of my life. Getting going to the training, four or five thousand people playing in front of fifty two thousand people every week. How, how can you not enjoy that? You know, yes, it's, yeah. it's pressure. Yes, it can be difficult. Yes, there's other things that go with it. But you know, I played non league. I was sat next to a, a plumber and a builder, an electrician. And if I made a mistake and we lost, and it cost him five quid of his 
of his <laughs> beer money that week, he was going to let me know. So, you know, <laughs> it, 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 well, it's it's, it's the old uh, the old story of Stuart Pierce still yeah, being yeah, a plumber yeah. and putting uh, putting an advert in the Notch Forest uh, program for his uh, plumbing services. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's um, no, Stuart's a good 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 friend of mine, and you know, we appreciate what we got. You know what I mean? And uh, I think sometimes. Like you've said, the world we live in, we get caught up. We've had some good times, and there's some good times to be had. And lower league, I, like I live in America now, and when people ask me, oh, I want to go to Stamford Bridge, I want to go to Old Trafford, I said, okay, that's great, but go and watch a local team. Go and watch a local non-league team, because that's really the football yeah. of, of the countries where you are, because that they're the people that don't get paid, doing it for the love of it, and give everything they've got for it. All right, is the quality there? But it... Some of the most funny, I mean, I played against Yeovil Town and some of the yeah. comments and the people saying things to me, don't worry about the chicken run at West Ham or a, a White Hart Lane. <laughs> I mean, that some of the things that they were saying are, are hilarious, but they was awful. <laughs> but but they, it is, it's non-league football. And uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a big part of what our pyramid is in, in Britain because... All right, absolutely. And, 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 the food, and for uh, spectators, the food is better than non-league uh, football as well. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it's cheaper. It's cheaper. Well, absolutely. It's absolutely. Cheaper. Um, um, after Newcastle, as you say, uh, you know, you, you're getting um, uh, getting older. Then you, you went to Derby. Um, uh, but you're always going to... That, that Derby side, unfortunately, uh, we're always going to be battling against relegation in, uh, when you first went there. Um it's a shame because they, you know they did have a couple of good seasons in the, in the Premier League. Um, you know, I think they had two Italians, wasn't it? Uh, Ravinelli. Um, Ravinelli was one. Yeah. Yeah. Was, but, uh, was it Irenio or Irenio? Irenio well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they they you had know? some quality players there. I mean, yeah, it was you know as I said, Bobby had said I wasn't going to play as much as I'd like, but, um, and I felt that I was still pretty fit at thirty three, nearly thirty four, that I could still play. John Gregory uh, needed to get some experience in the club. Um, he just took over. And um, the last eight games was against the top eight teams in the in the Premier League. And it's quite, you know, talking about it now. And they just got relegated with Wayne Rooney a couple of yeah. days ago against one of my old clubs as well, QPR. So, you know, it, it's a wonderful football club. The people there, it's a proper football club. The people, yeah. the good people. But the people that was running it at the time... Uh, was living way beyond their means, very similar to Leeds, like spending money they didn't have, you know, and as soon as we got relegated, I'm talking like the next day, the companies was going in the, the stadium and taking out computers, people was getting sacked straight away uh, in the club shop, in the office, and it was it was heartbreaking because, mm. you know, I'd had my time and we'd had our money at Premier League and, you know, we was always okay and I was part of the PFA chairman, I knew about the game and your pension and, and all things like that, but, you know, it don't, no one you know, gets you ready for something that's going to happen like that. And because of my personality, I was captain. Yeah. Players didn't get paid. People was losing jobs, crying, going into a petrol station, putting petrol in there. And there was a lady that used to work in the offices. She'd just been told she was sacked two days later. And she's in tears. She's got a mortgage. She's mm -hmm. got this. She's got that. And, you know, people don't understand that sometimes, you know, about yeah. you know what they're doing. And they were spending money as if it was going out of fashion. And, and unfortunately, the club has never really got over that and never yeah. really got over I, that. I, I just want to take the words out of my mouth. He never really uh, 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 got back to that kind of level. No, no. And as I no. said, for me and Bob Lee, we went there and it was a difficult time. And did I do? My, did I play my best soccer there, football there? Probably probably not. I gave everything, but it was there was so much going on behind the scenes. I was leaving the training ground like you normally do at like one, two o'clock. Yeah. And then, again, maybe I shouldn't have done, but because of how I was, I'd have meetings with people in the office, the younger players, the academy players, the, the academy coaches, you know, what's happening. And, you know, you was getting back into my apartment at like eight o'clock at night and then, you know, phoning up the PFA. Can we do anything with this kid? Can we do anything with him? The kid's got injured. He ain't got insurance. They haven't paid. So, you know, it, it was very, very, very difficult for everybody. And then you're trying to bounce back and get back in the Premier League, in the in the Nation League, you know, Football yeah. League is, is one of the hardest leagues to get out of because everybody thinks they should be in the Premier League. Oh, um, right. And you're playing, well, you know, with Cardiff, you're playing yeah. Saturday. Yeah. Saturday it's just relentless. Um, and as I said, everybody expects to be in, in the Premier League. But, um, you know, great great people, great club. Uh, enjoyed my time there, but it was, it, it was tough. More 
off the field than on the field because yeah. when you're playing, it's easy. You know, you just play the games. Um, but it, you know, it, it, was a, it was a good, good football club, and I'm, you know, I'm hopefully that they they bounce back. But uh, was that experience, that off-field experience, let's call it, uh, at Derby, uh, was that, did that uh, put you in good, good foot in, in, in what was to come later on in your career regarding uh, coaching? Uh, yeah. And, yeah, I'd give yeah. you a good standing type of thing. Yeah, I think it's, you know, adverse conditions. Again, going back to my background with non-league, you know, I was, when you're 13, 16, told you're too small, you know, what, what do you do? You have a sit in the corner and cry or you roll your sleeves up and prove people wrong and you know with with that adversity i was trying to help people out we did we got players money we got people back in their job we got you know people that was was owed money we got their money back so we, we did do that but yeah it definitely helped me i was still doing my ua for a license at the time i finished off my pro license in in 07 so it just helped me as a person you know if you go through that and you go for other things you know what else can really go wrong, you know? And it was, it was okay for me and Rob to defer our money for six months. But people like Danny Higginbottom and Riggetts, Chris Riggetts, they, they needed their money. So we had to find a way to help them out. And whether yeah. it was reversing our money to allow them to get paid, we would do that. And that's, some players didn't, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Some senior yeah. players said, you know, sod you, it's not my problem. And that's their prerogative, but that's not how I live my life. So... No, no, it's fair enough. And... and um... Towards the end of your career, then you went uh, to QPR, as you mentioned. I have to say, uh, Loftus Road is my best away day. I don't know. I think it's. I think it's because the the old fa- uh, no, the old style stadium. As a player, it must be really on top of you at Loftus Road. Yeah, that's uh, a really good football club. I'm smiling because I played under Ian Holloway. And, ah, and right. Okay. So you would have you would have played for them after we, uh, we beat you in the uh, or we beat QPR in the playoff final. Was it the following season? Yeah, yeah. I think it would have yeah. been the following season. So uh, Ollie had signed me. I'd, I said uh, Derby had let me go. George Burley had said, look, you know, financially and whatever, we we're not going to play you, uh, and we we feel now you're 35. You're not going to play a lot. We're going to go. So I said, fine, no problem, George. You know, make sure everything's okay, and I, I moved on. So. Ollie picked up the phone and said, um, you know, we want you to come down to train. So I said, perfect, no problem. So I went round and first training session, it's a 20 minute run. <laughs> it's, it's none of this walking and stretching. It's again, off you go, you're, you're running. <laughs> and, and, and Ian Ollie could still run. So we're chatting away and then he said, look, you know, uh, at Newcastle, they want us to get the ball. We're playing. Ollie was like, no, no. We're going to get it. You're up and down. I want you running up and down like you used to. I said, oh, that was back in 15 years ago. I said, I can't, I can't, I can maybe do two or three, but I'm not going to be able to do 10. And as I said, it was great. There was lots of good young players there. Uh, they managed to get promotion back in the championship, which was great. I didn't really do a lot to help that. I was there. I was on the bench. I played some games, being around the changing room, you know, being with the lads, Mark Birchall and that, who I still keep in contact, Kevin Gunn. Uh, some good people there, uh, yeah. but it was it was it was different because Ollie was Ollie, and you know yeah. he, he wanted us to do it. And it was only a few years difference in age, and uh, he was saying, "I want you to keep doing it." I went, "No, you got you got the wrong <laughs> one. You, you got me about fifteen years too late. You should have." You should have come <laughs> um, it was as I say, good good football club, and um, they got promotion. And um, you're right, great great football ground, good great yeah. atmosphere there. Um, lots of good memories of, of playing against them and playing there. And as I said, I, I wasn't there that long, but I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was only there for three or four months. But yeah, Oli Ollie, Ollie was fun to be around. He, he was entertaining. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine, just by watching him on TV, I can uh, I can imagine what, uh, what he's like in a dressing room. Yeah, no, he, he, he was fun. He, he's probably, he plays to the cameras a little bit more now, but yeah. he, he, was, he was good. He's got a heart of gold and uh, he wants players and he wants football to be played the right way and uh, I, I love him for that because he's a good guy no problem and so you went back to Dagnum then on uh, basically you started your coaching there uh, and, and also an advisor at uh, Brighton am I right yeah no no I wasn't that, I don't know where that's come from uh, that's oh, okay. I, don't, I left the speed to Brighton because if I was I was never paid because I never <laughs> yeah can the invoices out already yeah, I, I'm like <laughs> With the money, that they I don't know where that's ever come from. So I've tried to speak to Wikipedia, but yeah, you're right. I went, I went back to Dagenham and Redbridge where John was. Yeah. And I was doing my pro license, and uh, I said to John, you know, I'd love to. I'm living not too far away. 
uh, from where Dagenham played. And I said, look, I'd love to come down and learn off of you. Learn, just sit in the office, be a fly on the wall. If you want me to put cones out. They had a guy, Terry Harris, who's actually at Maystone now, the assistant coach. Mm-hmm. Terry had been with John Steele for many, many years. He'd been with non-league football with, with John for long. So Terry was the coach and I was just there learning and i did i learned so much off of john you know we'd go out to a field try and find a decent area where none of the dogs have been and people have been out there so me and terry would be out there doing that we'd be making sure the balls are all pumped up because we didn't you know they didn't have kit men and people like that doing it so it was great and i it was an education for me as as well as doing my pro license and being around you know players quick quick story you know I was always, I felt like a good professional. So, you know, there's non-league players, lower league players coming in and some of these players have played at a good level as well. But there was one particular kid that kept coming in late all the time and it really irritated me. You know, I was like, gaffer, you know, you've got to say something, leave it. Just leave it. So it kept going and going. And in the end, I said to the kid, look, you know, you're taking the pee. We're all here on time. What is it with you? And this went on for about a week and the kid just kept doing the same thing. So John then pulled me in the room and said, You've got another 25 players out there and all you're worried about is one kid that really don't care about you. So why are you care, caring about him? The other 25 want to learn off of you about what you've done, who you've played with, telling our striker what Alan Shearer used to do, telling our wingers what David Ginola used They don't want to worry about him turning up, mate. He's going. And that was one of the best advice because you, you're having to deal with a group. It's not just one yeah. person. And I spent so much energy worrying about this kid walking in late which the kid didn't give it, he didn't, he didn't care less what Warren was thinking, he couldn't care less. And John then said, and it, just little things like that as a manager, because you went, oh, well, it's got to be this. Focus on the group that's the most important, because they're the ones that want to learn off you and want to get better. So things like that was great. And, you know, being in that lower league, you know, having to deal with things. So that, that was a real education. And yeah, kind of being in the lower league ground and hearing some of the comments and the, <laughs> the, the fans that was coming in and, uh, as I said, a real education um, as a coach, not as a player, because I've been there as a yeah. player, but as a coach. So, uh, you know, John, John Steele, I've got a, a lot of re- you know, respect for. He's at, with Stan Collimore, actually, at uh, South End. He's oh, right, okay. Yeah. Right. I know that uh, Stan was uh, uh, getting involved in South End, but I didn't know John Steele was. Uh, yeah, was yeah still, he's, still he's there. He's, I keep in contact with John as well. And um, yeah, so it's small world, small world. So at that time where you. Uh, um, starting on your, your coaching kind of career, did you ever envisage that you're going to be spending many years in America? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> how, no, how, how did that all happen? I, I yeah. haven't got anything written down. How did that all happen? You have to you have to educate me on on, on your coaching career. Okay, so I've been coaching as I said, but I've been out to America on holidays, and you know whether it's Chicago, New York, Miami, uh, with the family, and just really enjoyed. The, the family, the positivity out here, the family experience and the way they was with their kids. The weather, obviously, is a big thing living in California. So, as I said, I finished my pro license in 07 and I'd been doing some work with Sky. Uh, Football First had just started the programme, Football First, the interactive programme. Yeah. So I was, I was working with them and I was lucky enough and really enjoyed that. That was the media side. So part of uh, Sky is Fox, Rupert Murdoch. And, you know, I, I did the England game against America uh, as a, on a panel with Peter Shilton. And I think Ian Wright did it. We was on a panel. We we're just okay. talking about the game. And the uh, CEO of Fox was there. And yeah, as I said, I've been going out there. It was in my back of my mind to, to see what it would be like. And he said, look, you know, the Premier League is getting bigger in America. We're in Los Angeles. I said, well, funny enough, I'm looking to come to San Diego. We had a meeting. Three weeks later, they, they'd signed me on a contract and uh, I was out here in America and in California. I was always going to come out here. It was my kids at the time, my oldest one was 10, 8 and 4. If right. I'd left it any longer, they would have been in high school and you know that secondary yeah. school and then we'd, we'd never would have moved. Uh, but we did it. It's been a life changer. I mean, it's been great working with Fox. I worked with LA Galaxy with the Academy, which was great to give me an insight of what football is like over here or soccer is like. Uh, yeah. But the main the main focus was come out here and be with my kids. I've got three young boys and I wanted to be a dad to them. I wanted to show them through school. I ended up coaching them. I didn't really want to do that, but I got a little bored of other people doing it and they wasn't giving them the right, I think, the right advice. So I ended up coaching and it's been great. You know, I've, I've watched them grow up. I've sat in the car with them for six hours driving around America, all the different states of being with them. So that's been great. 
now. Uh, they're, they're older. Uh, they don't need me as much as, as they want, you know, whether it's for petrol money or whatever, <laughs> they, which is fine, which is, I love it. Yeah. And, uh, I want them to, to be like that. Uh, but coaching's in my blood. You know, I love the media work. I'm hopefully going to be involved in guitar with Fox, with the World Cup. We yeah. do MLS, we do uh, international games as well. But coaching's what I love. Um, and I really want to get involved with that. I've spoken to a few people in the MLS. There's another league here called the USL, which is lower league. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just trying to find the, the right opportunity. But America just come across, it was really, you know, in the stars. You know, I'd always wanted to be out here. Bumped into a CEO of Fox, got on really well with him. He was a Scottish guy, Dermot McQuarrie. Got on well. I was coming out to America just to feel what it was like. I was on a, a, a visa, working visa for three years. Yeah. Ended up getting my green card. Now I'm a US citizen. Uh, and it's, you know, going into 14 years I've been out here. So um, I, I, I miss certain bits of England. I miss my family. I miss my mum, my brother, my sister and, and my in-laws. Uh, uh, you know, I miss the football. I miss like, the yeah. the feeling of it here. You, it's so diverse. There's so many different sports going on. They like they're outdoors. They're outside doing things. So I miss that. Um, but, you know, uh, the Premier League is huge out here. We watch the games. I'll be watching the Newcastle game later on, uh, 12 o'clock my time. So it, it, yeah. it's, it's great. You know, the quality of life out here is good. My kids growing up, them in the afternoons would go down the beach for four or five hours playing in yeah. the ocean and running on the sand. So exactly, exactly. Uh, like, like that with me now in, in Dubai. Um, I, or, or, well, I didn't, I didn't know that, um, you know, fingers crossed you got, uh, you got, uh, work in uh, in Qatar. So if I do actually get, if Wales do qualify, if Wales do qualify, um, maybe I'll have to take you uh, for a pint in a hotel bar. Yeah, uh, and and uh, you know somewhere somewhere in Qatar, but it'd be great to catch up on that. I'm just, no, well, just, just a couple of questions. Uh, one before before we finish off, um, the, you know, in your opinion, does America? Do they get football? They, they get, you know, yeah, they, they're getting it. It's it, there's still an area to to break down, but they just had a, a, a Charlotte, a new team that's coming to MLS. Seventy six thousand people turn up to watch it. Um, there's certain pockets, obviously, that are still predominantly baseball, but you're up against four major sports. Like in yeah. in Britain, you're up against maybe well, you're not up against anything because cricket and rugby is. Well, well below football. Football's number one by far, like Brazil, like Italy, like everywhere. It's football's number one. But over here, you're predominantly against four other major sports and you're up against colleges that are huge. You know, the yeah. Alabama football, you know, uh, whether it's crimson football, basketball with Villanova. You, you're up against monsters as well in other sports and other, you know, uh, college sports as well, which is huge. But they're getting it. They they understand it. The mentality. You go over the park now. Most kids are playing uh, football, soccer, than playing yeah. baseball or American football. Um, you know, basketball is huge. Obviously, hockey is big in the north of the country. But you know, it is getting bigger. I mean, the viewing figures, the Premier League, the World Cup. The, it was huge for the men's World Cup to qualify for Qatar. It's huge yeah. for them. It gives them you know kudos to do that. The women have been successful winning multiple World Cups. And their players, but domestically leagues they've struggled, but everything else has been phenomenal. So you know, it's um, it's definitely getting there. There's still a way to go. It's another generation away, if I'm being honest. If, okay. I think it's still that my kids, their kids, will, will be more predominantly talking about it. But it's just so exciting. You know, it reminds me very much of how the Premier League was in the mid '90s, well, where yeah. it's, it was like a wave of excitement and things was happening and. And, and it's the same feeling I get over here with, with with MLS football and and the way the things are going in the game, and it's uh, it's only going to get bigger. It's only going to get yeah. bigger and better. Um, just um, one more point. Um, I read an article earlier on, and it just made me think. And and uh, I knew that we have this chat uh, uh, this evening. Uh, this evening, my time. And um, and I I, I, I f thought it was a little bit of a connection. The article was um, target men. Is it a dying breed? Now, one, you made, uh, well, you were brilliant at crossing. You know, you, you mentioned about uh, Les Ferdinand and so on, uh, you know, doing, doing the Newcastle years and Syrah. Would you agree that uh, target men, old-fashioned, I, I wish you'd come back to two, 
playing two up front, if I'm honest with you. Uh, but now you're in coaching as well. Um, is is the old fashioned target man a day in breed now? No, I think it's an acquired taste. You know, you look at what um, and uh, Conte did at Inter Milan. You know, in Italy, when he played the two strikers up front, Lukaku as the target man, and then a player behind him. In Italy, it was always one, and then one beat, uh, like a number ten would play yeah. in that hole. Um, you know, Liverpool have gone with three up front. They've gone a different. Remember, Real Madrid did it with Gareth Bale, Ronaldo, and Benzema. They yeah. went with a three with Messi as well. So. That true target man has gone a little bit more, you know, it's not that Alan More versatile. Yeah, the old lump, back yeah. to goal, bringing other people into it. But the, the, there are, horse, I mean, you know, Newcastle needed a target man with Wood, the yeah. New Zealand player. from, from And it, it was just to relieve some pressure because they didn't have the capabilities to pass their way out. Sometimes when you're in adversity, you need just a simple approach and that's to relieve some pressure. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with hitting it up to your target man and he can bring other people into the game. People find it, up, say, oh, it's old-fashioned, the game's moved on. The game is evolving. You know, the game's about, like, so when the tippy-tap football play, it, it will evolve again. You know, Pep's evolved. You know, before it was like, oh, we've got to play Joe Hart, get out, because you can't play out from the back. Edison now smashes of all 50 yards. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, <laughs> when, point, it's what point. you have to do. And you you evolve. And that that's the nature of the game you're in. And, if you've got an Alan Shearer in your club, why on earth would you not get it to him quickly? And, you know, to answer the question, when I used to cross the ball, it, it, to be honest with you, it didn't even have to be a decent one because Les was brilliant in the air and Alan was brilliant in the air. And one yeah. would go near post, one would go far post, and then Gary Speed would come through the middle. So you, you couldn't really go wrong. As long as you b beat the first man uh, and give, your, give your, your teammate a chance, one of them's going to get on the end of it because they was that good at heading the ball. And, you know, the game is about scoring goals in different ways yeah and that's what i love at the moment you've got city do it their way and you've got liverpool do it their way and it's yeah. totally different and you look at messi and ronaldo they're totally different animals at the way that they play and you know that's what you want a little bit of diversity if everybody's doing the same thing you end up like an, a league like spain you know we just everyone yeah. passes all around and it's you know no one's got uh, different actions but you know, the, the old-fashioned striker, if you like, is, but it's part of our culture and history, the, the big old boy yeah, <laughs> striker. But he doesn't necessarily have to be big up front, you know. Another Welshman, Bellas, Craig Bellamy. Yeah. He, he'd play up front, but he'd play a different way of playing up front. You could knock it into him, but not necessarily the air. You could get the ball into his feet, yeah. his back, he'd lay it off to Kieran, and then he'd spin in behind. And then yeah. the, he, he was a different different proposition as well. But he'd play down the middle. He'd play as a nine. He'd play two strikers. And you could knock it into Bella's chest or his, his feet and he'd bounce it off and then spin in behind. Um, you know, that's the type of player he was. Ask Rio. Ask Rio Ferdinand what he's like. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was a pest. He, he was a pest. Yeah, but he, uh, both on and off the pitch, uh, uh, apparently. So, uh, oh, so no, well, I, just, love uh, I, love, I love Bellas. I've got a lot of fun. <laughs> no, he uh, was my neighbour. I used to live in Panaf. Uh, um, oh, wow. And um, just uh, finally, um, you mentioned guy speed. Um, any any uh, magical memories with Guy Speed? Yes, so so many with get with Gary. Um, you know his, his laugh, his his the way he had a guitar for about three years when I shared a room with him. I think Louise, his wife, bought him a guitar, or he bought him himself one one or the other. And his kids are the same sort of age as my oldest kids, Tommy and Ed. So I keep in contact with Ed. Uh, he's over in America, actually. Tommy was, but he's gone back to England. But Ed's over here. So I keep an eye on him. If he needs anything, he's over here. But Speedo was learning the guitar, and I shared a room with him. And uh, he, for two and a half years, he knew three, ch three notes of Wonderwork. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the most difficult. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a musician, but it's not the most difficult to learn you know it's only so many things so but he would do it it's like speedo do me a favor just learn something else because you would do it but he had that that laugh he loved his golf he was arguably him and stuart pierce was two of the best trainers i've ever been around best professionals uh funny man he, he used to love uh uh speaking to people D dean saunders he'd phone up dino and dino for like speedo wouldn't say a word but dino would be cracking jokes on saying things and speedo would be crying with laughter on the bed I don't know what Dino was saying to him, but you know, <laughs> was such a, Gary was such a uh, 
if there's any place you'd want to go to and play a game and you're up against it, 10, 10 against 11, Old Trafford, San Siro, New Camp, Speedo would be the first name you'd have on your sheet. He, he didn't worry about things. He'd go and play. He was a hell of a player. He was a much better player than... Well, people know how good he was. He, he was a top-class player. Um, you know, I've, he was a good friend of mine. I've, I've still... I said, I can't get rid of the text that he sent me, which was when it was going well out here. He said, I'm really pleased for you. It was it was great that you're, you know, things are going well. And, you know, he just, you know, you get emotional with it because he was he was a good, he was a good man. And I think of Louise yeah. and the kids and, you know, she's obviously had to move on. The boys have had to move on. But just a proper, proper man, just a real yeah. proper fella. And, you know, someone that's missed, we all feel a little bit, why didn't we know? I think me and Al have said that. You know, why Why didn't we understand or see it? But it is what it is. And, um, you know, yeah, yeah we, we miss him. We miss him because he was a, he was a proper person. Proper person. And it, you was a, you know, from, from a supporter point of view, both on, uh, you know, watching him play for Wales and, uh, you know, Everton and uh, Newcastle and so on. You come across very professional in it, in it, in his, uh, in it, in his mannerisms as well. And um, I, he was so, um, he was so proud of his kids. Yeah, but he was just as proud, or well, not just as proud, because it's not fair to say that to the kids. But he was so proud to be part of Wales, to represent Wales, not only as a player but also as a manager. And I spoke to him about Aaron Ramsey when the kid yeah. played against England. I said to speed up, what a player! He said, listen, this kid's going to be the the real deal. Don't worry about that. He's a proper player. And he spoke highly of him. And, and Speedo, you know, loved... We had, obviously, we had Stuart Pearce. It was me, <laughs> Rob Lee, and then there was the Taff, the Welshman. <laughs> we didn't get, get hammered. So, so particularly when my old mate Vinnie Jones played for you, it was like, really? You know, so <laughs> we, love, we love Vinnie, but uh, Speedo said, you've got Mark Hughes. You know, Ryan Giggs, Dean Saunders, you know, obviously Gary Speed, Gareth Bell. Mm -hmm. Vinny don't really fit into that bracket. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Vinny's found a new lease in life. But, uh, no, Speedo was great. It, you know, we, we would give him stick and he'd uh, it, 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 it try and give it back. But me and Piercy would just give it to him. So, yeah. It, it you was all, you all, all, fun. Better of him. all fun. All fun. On, on that note, uh, Warren, thank you ever so much. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I, I do apologise. It's gone on an hour now. And I'm really, really ever so grateful. I've enjoyed it. You took me back uh, down memory lane as a football fan. And uh, very good luck Good luck with you, uh, your coaching career and the media stuff in America. And I tell you what, I'm keeping an eye on your Twitter now, ready for, ready for your uh, information on Qatar. Yeah, if you're around, I'll, I'll take you up on your word. We're, we're meeting in a hotel lobby somewhere. Yeah, no worries. Even if it's £50 a pint, it's on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you're Welsh, not Scottish, so you're paying. Oh, you? well, yeah. <laughs> the, Welsh, the, Welsh, the Welsh are paying The Welsh are paying for it. <laughs> well, let's hope we qualify. That's the main thing. That's the first yeah. thing. Yeah, 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 we do. We do. It'll be good. Many well, thanks, my friend. Much, much appreciated. And uh, if you are in that WhatsApp group, let the others know if you want to come on. Okay, good man. All right. Thanks, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.